and you would get these kind of alternations of melodies between a saxophone and the marimba itself. This is 1924, Marimba Club. And then the first group to really sort of change their name are these gentlemen here, Marimba Band uh, of the uh, Tanches Hermanos. Uh, so it's Marimba Band Progresso is their name. In fact, there's another article that um, I found from 1927 referencing this kind of change in nomenclature of these bands. And the, the idea is that, okay, well, it's, they're not really just marimbas, but they're also bands. And it, once you, by the time you get to the 1930s, you have people just calling themselves marimba orchestra. And this is marimba orchestra K.J. Renak. And this performance is actually from uh, the opening of the Golden Gate Bridge in 1937. Uh, 1915, I believe, was the Pacific Exhibition uh, in San Francisco. And that's when the very first marimba, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Hurtado Brothers, the Royal Marimba Band, uh, were able to do some of their earliest recordings. But then um, by the 30s and 40s, you have these types of groups regularly uh, traveling to the United States. This is Marimba Orquesta Maderas que Cantan, right around the early 19, uh, 1950s. And by this time, you're starting to see the full big band setup, uh, where you got uh, four or five different saxophones, three or four different brass instruments, really sort of em emulating like the Benny Goodman sound, the Artie Shaw type of sound, which we should listen to right now. Speaking of which, uh, in the mid-1940s, a German uh, business owner by the name of Frederick, uh, Federico Mueller uh, had this club called El Gallito. And he had hired a number of musicians to come in and play marimba. Uh, they were called Marimba Excelsior. And after about four years of playing there, uh, that band kind of fell apart. He kind of reorganized the group into this uh, new ensemble, uh, a new marimba orchestra, that he just kind of put the name of his nightclub on. And this is Marimba Orquesta Gallito. And this is one of their tracks from the early 19th. One, they moved into the studios of uh, Guatemala's very first radio station. This radio station opened up in 1930 called TGW, but they began playing in a, in a uh, daily in a uh, radio program called Guatemarimba. And this is one of the tunes that they performed on that radio program. And this is actually one of the first instances of a uh, Guatemalan marimba group playing Colombian music. This is right around the time that cumbia had kind of moved from the folkloric realm into these larger dance orchestras. And uh, it became very, very popular all over uh, the northern parts of, of Latin America, especially in Guatemala. So this is a tune um, by Edmundo Arias, a Colombian composer, and this is a tune called Ligia. playing uh, for uh, Radio TGW, 
uh, for, for decades in Guatemala City. Uh, Gallito, here they are uh, at their um, outside of um, Tikal Records, the record company that they worked with for three or four decades. Um, they also began touring the United States. And in between 1970 and 1987, this band toured around the States pretty much three or four times a year. Uh, they were given the keys to the city of New Orleans. Uh, they were named Artists of the Week for um, the, the very famous um, Los Angeles radio station KWKW. Um, toured through Mexico, Cuba, Central America. Uh, they shared the stage with groups like Sonora Matancera, uh, Sonora Santanera, Bios uh, Caracas Boys, Los Tremendos de Colombia, and uh, Sonora Dinamita. So they were pretty much the most popular Marmola Orchestra. Uh, right up until the end of the 1980s. Uh, they were led by this gentleman right here, Marlo Queo Giron, uh, band leader for about 48 years, uh, wrote something like 2,000 different charts uh, for the band, and um, unfortunately, right around the 1980s is when we see this kind of shift, uh, both in musical taste and, as some of you probably well know, uh, uh, historical events in Guatemala. Um, before we get into that, though, uh, this is one last example. Uh, this is a tune by Marroqueo, here on called Alticalito, and this is a merengue. <laughs> denigrating these types of groups comes out, right? Late 70s, uh, early 1980s. And these guys are essentially just, you know, they're making, they're, they're doing very well for themselves uh, to be able to tour the United States three or four times a year. But at the same time, there's this kind of undercurrent from marimba de concierto bands and marimba pura bands kind of putting them down. And as I just mentioned, uh, the 1980s into the 1990s is when kind of the, the dam breaks. Uh, a lot of uh, Marimba's orchestras that were based in Guatemala City just completely shut down. Um, they were, weren't able to keep in business, keep their gigs going. Uh, as most of you probably well know, the very worst of the Guatemalan Civil War, 36 year Guatemalan Civil War, uh, was during the early 1980s. Uh, the pirate records industry kind of took over as well. Uh, Tikal Records also folded during the 1980s, the record company for um, uh, Gallito. Um, the, but what really happened in Guatemala was a gentleman by the name of Ángel González, uh, otherwise known as El Fantasma. Um, he was an ad rep and a syndication salesman for Televisa in Mexico. And in 1981, um, he bought two VHF uh, TV stations in Guatemala City. Between 1980. One in 2003, he bought two more radio stations and a number of radio uh, TV stations and a number of radio stations. And by 2003, uh, Angel Gonzalez and his his uh, his company um, owned or had access to, I should say, 30% of the Guatemalan radio audience and 96% of the Guatemalan TV audience. And because uh, the you know, Mexican conglomerate and Televisa still had minority ownership in Gonzalez's company. He pretty much had carte blanche to use whatever type of uh, Mexican television shows, Mexican uh, recording artists to pump into his stations uh, in Guatemala. And essentially what you have is just the absolute disappearance of local composers, uh, of groups playing Guatemalan music in, the, in that era. Now, with that, <coughs> getting to this people that I began to talk with, Los Enchantes Naves Conejos, as I mentioned earlier, this is a group that's been around since the 1880s. Now, uh, as opposed to Marimba Orquesta Gallito, who was based in Guatemala City, these gentlemen were from San Pedro Sacatepeque, San Marcos, which is kind of in the northwestern corner of Guatemala. And because they were not based in Guatemala City, they were kind of able to ride out the 1980s and 1990s. And in 1991, they uh, did a kind of medley of tunes by Los Tigres del Norte very famous uh, 
Mexican group. And here's an example of Comprobando Tradición, which is arguably one of uh, Los Tigres del Norte's most famous uh, narco corridos. Salieron de story of Emilio Varela and Camila Tejana. So Los Conejos, at least in my own sense of how this music works, are really the best example of how they're able to kind of bridge this gap between the more conservative elements of Marimba nationalism and popular culture. And what they do is they st they're still balancing the kind of sonic qualities of the marimba with, say, uh, the elements of ranchero or merengue or reggaeton. What they'll often do, in this example I'm going to play you here, uh, is change lyrics, for example. So this is uh, a very well-known tune from 2007 or 2008 by Vicente Fernandez called El Chauffeur. And I'm not going to play you Vicente Fernandez's uh, original version, but here you have uh, Los Conejos essentially changing the words from different towns in Mexico, in Fernandez's version, to different towns uh, in Guatemala. Oh, well, that's an excellent, that's, that's a, you could look at it that way, but they're still doing, pirateria is typically uh, done without record companies. So this is still, they're still paying uh, author rights to Vicente Fernandez, and they're still doing it the legal, the legal way. Pirateria is more like uh, taking recordings off of the radio and then selling it on the phone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Another way that these groups uh, are able to kind of still kind of keep their Guatemala in this, this is the last example I'll play here for you of Los Conejos, uh, is they'll take uh, a big hit like El Sonidito from 2008 um, from Los Hechiceros Band in Mexico, um, coincidentally on one of Angel Gonzalez's uh, record companies in, in Mexico City, um, and they'll insert uh, marimba solos. So in a, what is typically just like a dance tune that you would hear in Mexico, all of a sudden becomes uh, fodder for a marimba solo by this gentleman here, Adolfo Fuentes, who is sort of the um, godfather of, of marimba in this band. I'm only going to play just a short excerpt of this piece. <coughs> and there's David Miranda doing his thing, trying to kind of get the audience into it, regionalizing, you know, they're playing away with Tenango. Voy a los chapines. Un pedacito de mi marimba para todos ustedes. Y esto dice: Un, dos, tres, cuatro. It's a bit further into the solo. lyrics and rearrange music to kind of kind of find like a like a, a meeting point between
between these two, uh, what might be viewed as kind of different streams of music, but they're also reaching out internationally. Um, and then in 2009, they actually received funds from the Save the Children Foundation here in the United States uh, to, to promote a song or to produce a song that promoted uh, giving children breast milk. <laughs> Another thing I forgot to mention about these guys, you may have noticed this a lot, uh, that's the bunny ears. And it's actually a very useful marketing tool in a country where there's estimates of anywhere between 40 and 60 percent uh, illiteracy. Um, all the political parties in Guatemala, in Guatemala have their various uh, hand signals that they use uh, to kind of promote themselves. And conejos are no different. Um, this invariably means conejos, uh, no matter where you go in Guatemala. Now, um, just kind of wrap things up here. Uh, this music is starting to come back. Uh, we have populations very large populations now of Guatemalans and Central Americans in general here in the United States. But also we have um, a kind of retro uh, kind of revival amongst DJs. Uh, there's a program every Wednesday, also in Parque de la Industria in Guatemala City called Miracles de Cumbia, uh, organized by this gentleman here, Basico Tres. And they mix hip hop uh, with recordings from Gaito from the 1960s. So all of a sudden this music is kind of coming back full circle. Um, and they even, so they'll have uh, different DJ sets, but they'll also bring in these marimba orchestra groups. This is uh, Chicha Isu in Amaya, one of the um, top three uh, marimba orchestras uh, in the country. And so you'll get things that sound like this. So this music is just, it's coming back now. Um, they're, the Conejos actually, as a matter of fact, they'll be here in Chicago uh, in late May. So if anybody wants to come with me, uh, <laughs> I'll be driving down. Um, and uh, you know, after this kind of lull during the 18th, 1980s and 1990s, uh, coming into the 2000s, this group, particularly the Conejos, have been very successful in kind of reaching the, the market of, of uh, the Guatemalan diaspora and also the larger Central American diaspora. So um, I think I'm going to leave this here. I, we're quickly running out of time, uh, but uh, this is currently where my research is. Uh, this is kind of a, I try to give you just a, the general history of these groups here today. Uh, my own personal research deals with uh, issues of identity within these bands. So a lot of my research is with the musicians themselves and how they kind of uh, get around to the, how they uh, commandeer the labor market and switch from different bands and things like that, how they make a living being a musician in these groups. Um, but uh, my goal with this type of research is to really kind of provide some sort of uh, text, uh, some factual text uh, in Guatemala that tells the history of these bands, which as I mentioned earlier, is pretty much non-existent uh, in Guatemalan music history. So.